Amen. Lord, we come before you, before we open your word, to tell you that we need you now. We need you. Lord, I know many in us, our church family are hurting today. Many are facing trials and tribulations from having to do with their health or having to do with finances or having to do with their jobs or their families. And Lord, we just come before you declaring and knowing that you are the same God. You're the same God that parted the Red Sea and you're the same God who sent your son to die. You're the same God that resurrected him three days later. And you're the same God who's seated on the throne and you're in power. There's nothing that escapes your sight. God, we declare these truths today. And on behalf of our church family, I ask for you to meet with us today. Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to move in our hearts that's from you. God, show us areas of our life that we need to change. Show us parts of our heart that have not been fully given over to you. Lord, we know that it's obedience to you that pleases you. We want to please you today, Father. And so I pray as we open your word, as we hear a message, that we would hear your words today, your voice today, and not mine. Hide me behind the cross today, Father. And may you speak to hearts as only you can. And I ask this in your son's precious name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's great to see each of you here today. Uh, for those of you who watch online and are here live, the online's not working today. So uh, you'll just have to look at me. Uh, but uh, if you hear from somebody or family members or friends or whatever that it wasn't working, it, well, it's not working. And we don't know why. Uh, we'll figure it out later. But we're recording it and we'll post it whenever it does start working. So you can, you can watch the, the service later. So it's just us, all right? Must be present to win today, all right? Uh, but we're studying the book of Acts. And uh, Acts chapter 2, lessons from the first church and hope you'll pray for my wife she's not feeling well uh, she's at home and, and is not feeling well started feeling bad last night and just kind of got worse from there and so appreciate your prayers for her uh, I told our live class this morning this is a really bad week for my wife to to be sick because uh, I need her to make some queso for sun next Sunday I mean it's a uh, Super Bowl and all that you know it's a big deal this this week so no, uh, I know I haven't said much about this, but I don't want to let this day go by without just recognizing the fact that uh, I'm super proud that next weekend my daughter and Eli Ford are going to get married. Uh, this is my daughter's last week as an Edwards. <laughs> and uh, so we look forward to celebrating that. And uh, so pray for our family this, this week. Pray for me. It's going to be a, a stressful, emotional week for, for Dad. So... Uh, appreciate your prayers. But Acts chapter 2, uh, we're going to look at verse 42 through 47, uh, lessons from the first church. I saw uh, during the uh, snowpocalypse uh, this week that uh, I saw on Fox News one day that they did a story about church membership, and I actually was just not even paying attention to it. Just It was on where we were working on some other stuff, and, and I just glanced up, and it was the church membership and had statistics, and and so, uh, just like I used to do as a little kid, I'd grab the remote and I rewound the television. I rewind it. Uh, just kidding. You, you young folks have no idea what it was like to... If you missed it, you missed it. I mean, it was no way you were ever going to see it again. Uh, but I rewound the story and watched the whole story, and here was what it was. In 1992, it said that 71% of Americans were active members of a local church. In 1992, 71% of Americans... Uh, today, of course, is why the story was written. It says today only 43% of Americans are members of a local church at all. From 71 in 1992 to 43 uh, in 2021. And that's very sad because it tells us today that fewer and fewer people see the need to be part of a church. And even worse than that, 
fewer and fewer people see the need to follow Jesus Christ. And the question that we've got to ask ourselves as a church is why? Why is that? Why is that statistic true? And I think that we need to go to the source of truth for the answer to that question. And I think we'll find the answers to that question right here in the book of Acts as we study it. And so, uh, a few weeks ago, I told you all that our church, even though it began in 1970, really, the beginning of North Park Baptist Church was 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. That's where our church began. And so I want us to go back there, and because what we're doing today is we are continuing, and every church is doing today, is continuing what they started on the day of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the Passover, and we studied that last week. So here, here's the first church. And what I want us to do is kind of compare our church, compare ourselves with the things the first church was doing, and what are we doing today. And so that's what we're going to look at in our, in our uh, message today. We see here in chapter 2 this newborn church that just started, as we say last week, Peter preached a sermon on the southern steps there in Jerusalem, and, and 3,000 accepted his message and they were baptized and so we know that uh, on this church that, that the Holy Spirit had arrived and excitement was there and Jesus' memory was fresh and, and all of the new exciting things that were happening in that church that the average church just doesn't have happening today. And we've got to ask why. And so let's remember where we came from. Remember where we've been here. Jesus was resurrected. He stayed around for 40 days and, thousands, and uh, uh, over 500 people saw him. He appeared with the disciples, spent a lot of time with them. Then he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. And I told you where that was and showed you pictures of that. And then uh, after that, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost from the southern steps and, and 3,000 people were saved. They were baptized. And then it goes to verse 41. Look in chapter 2, verse 41. It says that then so those who accepted his message were baptized and that day... About 3,000 people were added to them. So here we are on the very first day of the church. The very first day, the founding day of the church, they have 3,120 members. And think about that. How in the world do we know they had 3,120 members? How do we know these people were members of the church? Well, in order to know how many people they were, they had to have counted them, right? Right? And so they had this crowd, and they're looking at these people, and they're like, he's one of us, he's not. She's one of us, she's not. There was some kind of a designation, some kind of a way to tell who, was a, who had made the decision, who had been baptized, and who had not. They counted them. There had to be some kind of a role, some kind of a roster, some kind of a way to identify them. They knew who was a part of the church who had just made a profession of faith. They knew who the original 120 were. They knew who had just got baptized that day. And this is the precedent for why today we have membership in a church. Why we have membership roles. Why we have a, a role in our life class so we can keep track of who has committed to uh, the church, who has committed, who are the leaders supposed to keep track of and to follow up with and that type of thing. And that's why we have membership today. And so this first local assembly of believers, think about it, this was the first church ever. There was no church in the Old Testament. This was the first church ever that we're talking about. Now, churches like to be, be first, right? Especially Baptists. We want to be first, right? And I love that there's, there's, other, there's, there's like second, but I've even seen a third Baptist church before. I'm serious. And like, we want to be first. Well, this was the first. Nobody was more first than they were, all right? And this is the very first church. And so what was this church like? And an even more important question was, can we be like that church? Amen? That's what we got to look at. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because whatever it is, this church had it. Whatever that is, it had it. And today, most churches, even big, big, big churches, don't have it. What is it? It is whatever it takes for people to be added to their number every single day. They had it. And I don't know about you, I want to find it. What is it? Because that means people are getting saved. And people are coming, and they're getting saved, and they're getting saved. And the people are, are telling people about Jesus, and they're sharing the gospel, and they're giving, and they're sacrificing, and all needs are being met. That's what it is. 
And so I've broken it down like this. I'm looking at it as this church had the right DNA. So I want us to look today is what is the right DNA of a church? This church had it, and how can we get it? So this church had the right DNA. What is that? I think there's four things of the DNA of this church that are important that we need to understand today. Number one is it was a saved church. The first little DNA molecule, if you want to look at, is it was a saved church. It says that those who accepted the message were baptized. It wasn't baptism that saved them. It was accepting the message that saved them. Baptism was a sign, a public profession, that they had accepted the message. They weren't baptized until, they, until after they accepted the message. That's what saved them. The Bible's clear, though. Listen, the Bible is very clear that the, the identifying mark, the identifying mark of who is truly saved is someone who remains. Let me, let me explain this to you. Jesus said in Luke chapter 15, He is the vine, and we are the what? The branches. He's the vine, we're the branches. And Jesus says that a true branch, a real branch, abides, remains, continues to be connected to the vine. That's what He says. It, it stays there. It stays connected. And, and, and Jesus even said that here is the, in chapter 8, he talks about, uh, here's how you know you're truly one of my disciples. You remain, and that word depends on the translation you use, remain, you continue, you abide. And that's what Jesus said himself. This is not what I'm saying. This is what Jesus said twice in the book of John, that you're truly saved if you remain. Now let's talk about that for a minute. That means you stay there. You, you keep showing up. It, it, it's like this. I got my feelings hurt at church, but I kept showing up. I, I, I didn't like this or that. I kept showing up. I didn't get my way, but I remained. I kept showing up. COVID hit. Things went crazy, but I kept showing up. I got a cancer diagnosis, but I kept showing up. I have a crisis going on in my life, but I kept showing up. I remained, I remained, no matter what happened, I remained, I remained. And that's what we see in Scripture, and Jesus said that's how you know somebody's really saved. People always ask me questions about, well, what, what about so-and-so? We're, we're, I hadn't seen them in years, and what about this person, and what about that person? And They believed for a while, and they drifted away. Listen, that's been a problem since the first church. Because here's what John wrote about this church. We know that, that uh, this was a problem because he said this in 1 John chapter 2. He says, talking to people that are no longer around, people that used to do this and used to do that, it says, they went out from us because they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out from us so that it would be made clear that none of them belongs to us. What he's saying is the people that don't continue, the people that don't remain connected, it's all over the New Testament, that is a sign of true salvation. And if you're really born again, if you really come to know Christ, you'll remain in Christ and you'll remain in His church. That's what Scripture says. And I know we don't like to hear that today. And I know some of you will be like, well, you're, you're, you don't understand. Blah, 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 blah. I'm, saying, I'm not saying if you decide not to be a part of North Park Baptist Church anymore. I'm talking about if you leave church completely and it's never a part of your life ever again and you never pick up the scriptures again and you just used to, used to, used to, used to, used to. Our, the fastest growing religious denomination in the United States is the people that used to. Where are they going? They never had it in the first place is what scripture says. That's what this first church is telling us. You remain, you remain, you remain. If you really come to know Christ, if Christ is truly living in you, if the Holy Spirit is truly living in you, you're going to stick around. That's what Scripture says. So the first thing this church did right was the members were all saved. You might be like, well, duh. Well, think about that for a minute. Why is that? Should that be a surprise to us? Well, I think today there's a lot of churches full of people that aren't saved. Well, does that mean that, that people that aren't saved can't come to North Park? No, no, that's not what I said. Not at all what I said. 
We want lost people to come. We want lost people to be here hear message. We want them to learn about Jesus. But what I'm saying is the membership of the church can only be people that have accepted Christ. That's what this church, first church did, and that's what we believe here at North Park. Because the, uh, you know, those who, who serve, those who lead, those who work are people that are saved. It's who can we count on? It's like, hey, we're, we're gonna, North Park is going to be this. Are you a part or not a part? Like, we, we need to know. What, what, what team are you on? But in this first church, they were a real group of people. They were, they were for real. They were committed. They all were committed. They all loved the Lord. They all obeyed His commands. They all put Him first. And that's why they turned the, ups, the world upside down in a couple of months. Literally, later on in the New Testament, it says these people turned the world upside down. Could you imagine 120 people that turned the world upside down? There's, at that time, there probably wasn't 8 billion people in the world like there is today. It might take us a little bit longer than a couple of months. But as I told you, I get excited about this because 120 people turned the world upside down 2,000 years ago. And we got way more tools to work with than they ever did. We can do it too. They were all committed to Christ. That was where they started. You know, when people come to, to me or to our church and say, hey, we'd like to, to be a part of your church. We'd like to join our church. The first thing I do is I sit down with them and I say, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? That's where it starts. Because to be a member of the church, you must know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? And that, that's not being, being uh, uh, critical or judgmental or anything like that. That's being exactly what the example we see in Scripture is. The church is those who are saved. Period. I don't understand why that's controversial today. But what's so cool about it is many times that's when people accept Christ. And as I look around the room today, many of you, I remember a conversation we had, it may have been 20, 30 years ago, but we had that conversation and that's when you accepted Christ. Was you're like, hey, I want to be a part of the church. I don't understand the church. I don't know what to do. I don't know any of this. And I said, hey, have you accepted Christ? Well, I'm not really sure. I said, well, let's nail that down right now. And you prayed and you received Christ. You got baptized and the rest is history. Amen. That's why we do that. It's a clear, a clear thing. It's like saying, hey, I want all of the members of our football team to wear the same jersey. Right? How would it look if everybody was wearing a different color jersey and a different one? You don't have a team. You can't identify who it is. And that's all we're saying. So the church is made up of those who've been saved. Number two, the second little molecule of that DNA is they were a studying church. Look at verse 40, 42. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The thing they were committed to is the Greek word, the didache. The didache, the, 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 uh, the study, the teaching. They were committed to the teaching and they, they gave themselves to being taught. They were so hungry to be taught that most of them that had come from other nations didn't go back. They said, we're going to stay here and just keep getting taught, keep getting taught. This is very scriptural. Many of you have heard this. And we've talked about this for years now. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, here's the way it's going to be, Timothy. Look, I have taught you. Now, I want you to go teach some faithful men who are then going to turn around and teach other people also. It, it, the church is designed to be a, a cycle of teaching that is a reproductive cycle of teaching. It's like, I have been taught, right? I grew up in church. I was taught as a child. And, and I was taught by my father and many other uh, Sunday school teachers and youth pastors over the years that I was taught by. And then I went and learned in seminary and college, and now I'm teaching you, and your role is now to, who are you going to teach? Does all of this flow to you and you soak it all up and just die with it? Or are you going to teach somebody else? Because that's what we see happening in this church. It was a reproductive cycle of teaching. And they kept teaching and they kept teaching and they taught others and they told others. And that's what we saw there. And this is how they changed the world. Listen, there's nowhere in the Bible that says the church is to be a spectator organization. It's not a place where you just sit and watch some kind of a performance and then you do nothing. That's not in Scripture. Not at all in Scripture. And nowhere in Scripture it is the church to be an entertainment organization either. <laughs> you know? It's not that, hey, i got to get entertained. Now today, that's what we've turned the church into. It's got to be entertained. People that want to come in here preaching like I'm doing today for about 30 minutes... <laughs> uh, 
Like, I ain't signing up for that. That's boring. Give me some, some dancing people or get some smoke or some... i got to have something fancy, right? Now, I'm not saying that all that's wrong. But I'm, I'm saying we don't want to just hear a message anymore. We want to be entertained, right? There's no entertainment going on in this church. <laughs> you know what's going on? Teaching. Doctrine. And they applied themselves to it. They searched it. You know, 2 Timothy 2 says, study to show yourself approved. Study to show yourself approved. The doctrine is the basis of everything. And that's why we are committed to teaching the Word of God. This is our textbook. I, I didn't, you know, I'm not here to tell you how to, you know, how to, how to ha- handle uh, difficult situations at work, right? We're, we're here to tell you about how, how to handle life from the Creator of life. Doctrine is the basis of everything, and that's why we're committed to that. And we teach the Bible, and we teach it over, and we teach it over and over again because that's what you need. This is the only truth that exists in the world today. This book. The Great Commission of Jesus, He said, Go, make disciples, and entertain the heck out of them. Is that what He said? Go, make disciples, and what did He say? Teach them. Teach them what? Everything I commanded you, disciples. So then you got to go back. Well, what did he command them? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You see what I'm saying? Teach them everything. That's what our job is. That's what we are to do. We can't lose focus. 2 Timothy Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, preach the word. And he says, preach the word because the time is coming, Timothy, where people will not endure... And what will they not endure? Sound doctrine. Or good teaching. Or the truth is what he's saying. Paul says, preach the word, Timothy, because the day's coming where people are not going to tolerate it. We're there. We're there. Did you know there was a, a, a congressman in, in, in this week? I get these alerts about these crazy bills that come up. In Washington, D.C., a congresswoman submitted a bill that would outlaw vacation Bible school nationwide. Now, it's not going to pass. But I'm just saying, you know, we're there, folks. The, the days of, well, one of these days, one of these days, it, it's here. And that's why we got to preach the truth. And we got to preach the word. Because the day is here where people won't endure sound doctrine. What is that doctrine? That's the right DNA is what I'm saying. The right DNA is this book. We've got to know it. We've got to study it because it's the truth. And we've got to teach it to our kids and everybody around us. And listen, any pastor, any, any shepherd who won't teach his people the truth and won't teach, and, and won't, they, don't love, they don't love you. I'm sorry. They're, they're not doing their job if they're not preaching the truth of the gospel. And that's what the Bible says, not what I say. The third part of DNA, I want you to understand this. Not only were they a saved church, they were a a studying church, but third, they were a fellowshipping church. Look at verse 42 again. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. To the fellowship. What is that? It's spiritual togetherness. Spiritual togetherness. Uh, It's the interaction of believers with each other. And, And we love fellowship. Amen? I mean, Baptist church growing up, every you had the, the auditorium and you had the blank hall. What was it called? The Fellowship Hall, right? We even named a room after it. Why? Because that's what we got together and ate and had stuff and did stuff and at the Fellowship Hall. If anything was in the Fellowship Hall, I knew we could eat. That was, I was always excited about that, right? And so, but listen, fellowship is permanent, right? Let me explain this to you. We're all going to go home. We fellowship today. We said hi to each other, but we're going to go home, right? And we may not see each other for, for three or four days or maybe another week until we see each other again. But that doesn't mean that, that we're still not having fellowship with each other. But the joy comes when we're together. The joy comes when we're face-to-face with each other. Amen? That's where the joy comes, right? It's like my family, right? I, I'm... I'm still a part of the Edwards family, even though I may be hundreds of miles away from them. 
But when we come together and we're face to face and belly button to belly button with each other, we have joy because we're together. Physically, spiritually, we're together. And that's what they were doing. They were together. They were nose to nose. They were uh, together. And, and they were sharing with each other. Look, look all the way in verse 44 to 46. It describes what, what they're doing. Look at this verse 44. It says that now all the believers were together. They held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. Verse 46. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. And they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude. They had things in common daily, every day they were at the temple together. They were breaking bread at home and together with, with private houses. They shared meals together. They ate together with gladness. They were, they were one group. And let me tell you something. In our modern world today, for a multitude of reasons, most people don't participate fully in the fellowship of the church. You know, I, I grew up in church. I've been in church my whole life. I was born in church. I was born a preacher's kid, right? I'm 51 years old right now. There's never been a time in my life where I have not been a, a member of a church. And I can think back to some sweet, sweet fellowship I had. In there. What I'm saying is the, the most joyous times in my life has been being a part of a church. In high school, my football team won the state championship. That was awesome. I've been on mission trips around the world, with, with mostly with people from this church, but even people with other churches, and I've gone with some other pastors that were different. There is nothing that even comes close to comparing to fellowshipping with the local church. Nothing. There is no organization in the world. There's no joy like being a part of the church. It's the fellowship of the believers. And the local church is the best thing going today in this world. It is the greatest organization. It is the best thing going. Why? Because it doesn't belong to a human being. It's the Lord's church. This is the Lord's church. It's not my church. I could die in the next five minutes and it would still continue. It's the Lord's church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's the Lord's church and we are blessed to be a part of it. And listen, if you're a professing Christian and you're not involved in the life of a church, in the fellowship of a church, in a small group, a life class, when we get together, you need to be there. You're missing out on one of the biggest parts of the DNA of a church and what makes it so special. COVID robbed that from us, right? And we went crazy with it a little bit. We all did. Everybody's guilty of it, right? We all went a little haywire. If we knew what we knew now, we wouldn't have done what we, a lot of stuff we did then, right? I'm not saying this as a church. I'm saying as, as a people, as a nation, as churches all together, right? But that robbed us of some of that fellowship. And, and it, made, it made for many people a, a deal like, well, I can just watch online. And now it's a new, a new thing that Satan is using to keep people from the fellowship. Because when there's not constant fellowship, then we tend to lose that connection. And we're like, nah, I don't really need it. Watching online does not bring you that joy, that fellowship. I've probably watched four or five times now since we started that when I hadn't been here. And look, I, I can watch Jason or Jay preach online, but I mean, I even watch myself sometimes. And I'm like, how do people stay awake through this? <laughs> Seriously, like when you're watching online, I'm like, golly. Like we need to put some, somebody needs to just run back and forth every now and then just to keep some action going. It's just like. Still, anyway, probably too much information for you there, but <laughs> what I'm saying, though, is it's like a, it's like a, I, I love this illustration. It's just like a campfire, right? Sitting around a campfire is one of my favorite things to do. I love to feel the, the glow and the heat and to see it and to smell it and to hear it. But you know when I, when I watch a campfire on television, it doesn't give me none of that. Right? It's just not the same. That's the point I'm trying to make. The fellowship of the believers together gives you that glow, gives you that joy, gives you that feeling. I don't even have to know you. 
Hey, but if you love the Lord and I love the Lord, man, we can fellowship together. We can be great friends, right? And, and so that's what I'm trying to say. And this church had it. That church had it. You know, think about it. Many people today, I shared a statistic with you the other day. The Gallup organization did a whole survey of church members and, and across the U.S., and they asked the question, what is regular church attendance? The number one answer was uh, once every six weeks is now considered regular church attendance. Once every six weeks. The, uh, yeah, think about that for a minute. I don't say this to be rude or, or whatever, but what if you only went to the bathroom once every six weeks? Think about this with me. What if you only ate once every six weeks? What if you only showered once every six weeks? What if you only brushed your teeth once every six weeks? What if you only went to work once every six weeks? What if you only drank something once every six weeks? What if you only breathed once every six weeks? Why is it that everything in our world, it's not okay, but in the church, it's okay? Why is that? Why is that? Folks, don't neglect meeting together. I can't stress it strongly enough. You know the people that tend to, you know all the used to's? You know where it started? Ah, it started with their lack of attendance. That's where it starts. That's where it starts every time. It's been said by people way smarter than me that your church attendance is the thermometer of your spiritual, uh, where you are spiritually. Listen, Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, and listen to this, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Listen, people ask me all the time, Is the Lord coming back? You know, He's coming back. Well, when? I don't know, but I guarantee you one thing, we're closer than we've ever been. We are closer than we've ever been. And so it says here that we are to show up. And what's cool is verse 24 tells us why we're to show up. We're to show up to encourage, to uh, motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's why. That's why we're all supposed to show up. Because here's the deal. I need to be motivated to do what's right. That's why we're supposed to show up together. Because I need you to motivate me. I need you to motivate me to do what's right. And guess what? You need me to motivate you. To love and good works. That's what the Bible says. That's why. Don't neglect meeting together. This church was together. And it says the symbol of their togetherness was in verse 42, the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. Why is that communion? Why is that so important? Because it's at the foot of the cross where we're all equal. There is no hierarchy at the cross. There is no, well, I'm on a higher level than you. I'm, I'm up to level three now. Or where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's nobody better than anybody. They all have sinned and fallen short. Amen. You, me, and everybody that you know and love, we've all fallen short. And that's why the communion brings us back to where we should be. Equal. We're all equal. No matter what our, our, our race is, no matter our, our upbringing, no matter what we do for a living, no matter if you're rich or poor, no matter if you're skinny or fat, it doesn't matter. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. And that's what this church believed that, they knew that, and they were together on that. Jesus wants us to be sure we never forget that, and that's why he said, hey, remember me. Eat this bread, drink this cup, remember me. The fourth thing, the last thing about their DNA was it was a praying church. It was a praying church. It says they were together, the breaking of bread and to the prayers in verse 42. Man, if there's anything you'd ever want about a church, it'd be, the pr- it'd be a praying church. Jesus had told all of them, he told his disciples in John 14, that listen, anything that you ask in my name, I'll do it. And they took him seriously. They took him at his word. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed. They had meetings just for prayer. But think about today. Sadly, it's very neglected in a lot of churches. Very neglected. You know, you have a, a rock band, a Christian rock band show up at the church, man, it's packed out, right? Uh, uh, you have a, a, you know, Toby Mac and Crowder are coming to town. They sold out Friday night and they had to add a second show on Saturday night. So many Christians are going to pack this place out, right? I love Toby Mac. I love Crowder. 
but I love my daughter more, so I'm going to my daughter's wedding instead of that. But, but listen, you know what would happen? Probably said, hey, we're going to have a, a, a Metroplex-wide prayer meeting in evangelism. Mm. There, there'd be a couple hundred people show up, maybe. That's it. We're going to pray. You know, Most churches, I mean, every church I've ever been a part of, some big event, packed out. Prayer meeting, nobody. You see what I'm saying? And this has been for decades and decades and decades. And it's not just our church, it's every church. I talked to pastors. I was on a, on a Zoom thing this week, and that's exactly what we're talking about. We can't get people to show up to pray. We can't people to get show up to witness. The, the Bible says we're supposed to go tell us about Jesus. I can't get anybody even to show up to train and to go do that. Nobody wants to do it anymore. Nobody cares. They say it's my job. That's not what the Bible says. It's everybody's job. It's my job, yes. Not as the pastor. It's my job as a Christian. You see the difference? This is a praying church, and we neglect prayer in so many ways. Listen, I believe we'd see things happen that we'd never dreamed of if we could become a praying church. And that's each of us individually praying more. I truly believe in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God is able to do immeasurably more than any of us could ask Him. Than any of us could even dream up, it says. God can do more than that. I believe it. So this first church had the right DNA. It also had the right commitment. It had the right commitment. What is the right commitment on the part of the members of a church? Number one, you've got to know Christ. You've got to be saved. Number two, you've got to be able to study the Word of God. You've got to be willing to be taught the Word of God. You've got to be saved. You've got to study the Word of God. Third, you've got to be involved in the fellowship. You got to be involved in a fellowship, be part of a small group, uh, meet together, sharing, t- loving, serve together, communion together. Then fourth, you got to be praying together with other believers. That's the right commitment. Commitment to pray together. If we would pray together for the lost to be saved and, and things to start happening, for for miracles to happen in people's lives, I think our community would look at us and man, I don't know what's going on up there at North Park, but man, let's let's go check it out. Let's go see what's happening up there. And last, commitment, the right commitment is to be a giving church. This first church sacrificed everything. You see that. They were, for whoever was in need, whatever it took for the gospel, for the teaching to advance, they did it. So if we have the right DNA, that'll lead us to the right commitment. And it'll finally lead us to the, to the right character. Look at what kind of church this was. This is cool. Look at verse 43. It says, then fear came over everyone. And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. What? Fear? I call this, it's really the word awe in the Greek. It's, it's awe. Awe came over everyone. So I'm saying these, this was an awesome church, right? It was an awesome church. That was their character. Why? Because everyone was filled with awe. What was the awe that they were filled with? It was the idea that there's something supernatural going on here, and everybody recognized it. There's something going on here that we can't take credit for. Only God could do that. And that, that, that's what, if we'll, if we'll make these commitments, that's what will happen. God is working, and I can't explain it in any other way than awe. And that's the word that was used. Listen, I want to show you real quick another time they used the word awe. Turn to the left, to Luke chapter 7, for just a second. Because Luke wrote both of these books, and he used the same word right here. So let's look at what he means by this word. Chapter 7, verse 11, look at what Luke says. Chapter 7, verse 11, Luke says this. He says, soon after he was on his way to a town called Nain, his disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. Just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the city was also with her. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, don't cry. Then he came up and touched the open coffin and the pallbearer stopped and he said, young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Now, here's the same word coming up in verse 16, the exact same word, the exact same author used. Ready? Then fear came over everyone. It's literally the word all. All came over everyone. And what did they do? They glorified God. They glorified God. You see that? 
That, that's what this word means in Acts chapter 2. That awe came over to people. It doesn't mean they were afraid. That's what, when God is doing something, He's doing it to bring glory to Him. And, and that's why God does miracles, is to bring glory to Himself. Things that cannot be explained. Everybody in town, at the, in the town of Nain that day, had a sense of that something was happening. Everybody in Jerusalem that day had a sense of awe that something is happening in this church and through these people. Man, I pray that we could have that same effect. Man, I pray we could do that. And I know we can. Because we can't say we're not big enough church. Because we got 120 people. that could, And we can do it. Through the Lord, of course. The second... Uh, thing about the character of this church, not only were they awesome, they were miraculous. Look at verse 43 again. It says, many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now follow me here. This is a church where miracles were happening all the time. And next week you're going to hear about the very first miracle that happened in chapter 3 where a guy who goes from laying on the ground his whole life, never been able to walk, to it says he walked into his very first service uh, uh, in the temple. He walked in there, says he was walking leaping and praising God. He walked in the door, leaping and praising God. How'd you walk in this morning? Oh, God. Man, I should have stayed home. I mean, I had five days at home this week, but, you know, man, I, I'm so wore out. Right? I'm just joking around, but I'm just thinking about how do we enter the worship service each day? Do we expect God to do anything at all? This guy was like, I don't know what happened to me, but I know where to go jump up and down about it. And I'm not saying be charismatic and all that, but it wouldn't bother me a bit if somebody wanted to jump up and down and said, Woo, look at what God did. That wouldn't bother me one bit. That's how he came to church. The miracles had a purpose, though. I want you to understand this. There's miracles had a purpose. And that was pointing to the message of Christ. The miracles that are happening in here that we're going to read about all through the book of Acts, these miracles had a purpose, and it was to point to the message. It was to say the message of Christ is the true message. That's what they were pointing to. That's why Jesus did miracles. In John 14, Jesus said, Believe in me because of the miracles that I do. The miracles point right to him as Christ the Messiah. It's like this. If three dudes came up here and said, all three of them claimed to be the Messiah. One of them raises a guy from the dead. I'm going with that guy. You see what I'm saying? The reason for the miracles in that day was to confirm the teaching, to confirm whose teaching was correct because there was a false teachers everywhere. But only one was doing miracles. And that was Jesus Christ. And so you might be saying this, and I'm sure you are. If you're not asking this, you're asleep. Well, then why don't we do miracles today? Preacher, why don't you? Go stretch somebody's leg out, make it grow longer. Why don't you, why don't you go pop somebody in the head or wave your coat at somebody? Why, why don't we do that? I see it on TV. I hear of other churches doing it. Why don't our church do that? Because miracles are, for that purpose have ceased. Let me explain that. The word is complete. The word is complete, Right? The purpose of the miracles in the New Testament, the purpose of the miracles in Acts, were to prove the authenticity of the words. The word is not complete. We don't need miracles to prove the word. We have the word to prove the word. Does that make sense? And so uh, that's why we don't have miracles today. So, again, same three guys walk in here. They're teaching three different things. I don't have to have a miracle to see who's teaching the truth. I have the truth to see who's teaching the truth. See the difference? That's why we don't have miracles today. We've got the word. So God doesn't do miracles today? Is that what I'm saying? No, 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 no. God does miracles today. God's done miracles right here in this church. God's done miracles right here in, in, in some of your hearts and lives. Just recently. Uh, but, but listen, these miracles are not for the same purpose. The miracles now are to bless somebody or to encourage somebody or to increase the faith of somebody. That's why we have miracles today. It's a blessing. It increases our faith. Listen, just, just recently... Miss Sandra Davis, we've been praying for her. She was told by a doctor that he was 90% sure that she had pancreatic cancer. And that he had seen on MRIs these, these massive growths and things on, in her, her body. And he said, what I want to do is before we go all in on this thing, let's just wait for two weeks and, and let's see if it settles down. Maybe we can get a clearer picture. Maybe we can see what's going on. She went back two weeks later 
for an MRI, and the doctor said, there's nothing there. It's completely gone. All I see is, a, is maybe a cyst or two, but there's no cancer. I'll see you in six months. That's a miracle, folks. That's a miracle. Right here in our midst. Now, God didn't do that for Sandra to prove His Word is true. He did that to bless her, to encourage her. He did that to bring Himself glory. I'm telling you about it. So God can be glorified. That's the difference. That's why miracles do happen today. But not for the same purpose as we see in Scripture. Not as a sign for people that don't believe. So if you're a Christian today, I also want to remind you this. The greatest miracle that God ever did for you. The greatest miracle God ever did for you is save your soul. If, you, if Christ is living in you today, that is the greatest miracle He could ever do for you. And He's done it. Yes, miracles happen. And the last thing we see here, it was a sharing church. Verse 44 and 45. It says they, all the believers were together. They held things in common. They sold their possessions, distributed it to all who had a need. So, socialism? Are we supposed to all live together, share everything, get a compound somewhere and have a commune? And sounds a little weird, doesn't it? What was going on here? I shared earlier, remember that 3,000 people got saved. The purpose of their gathering was Pentecost. They, that's 50 days after the Passover. At Pentecost was one of the three major Jewish holidays. Jews came from all over the world. Remember the miracle in chapter 2. is they, How is it that they are speaking our language? And it even went down to this, this tiny little portion of the island of Crete that speaks this special dialect. One of them said, they speak in my language. How do they know that? Remember all of that happened? So the, out of these 3,000, there's people from all over the world. Where are they staying? They're not at the Holiday Inn, right? They come into town, and what the custom was, you, you'd let people stay with you. You'd be like, hey, you guys from, from Ecuador or whatever, hey, yeah, come on over. You can stay with us, you know, until Passover's over, so it's just for a week or so. And then they'd go back home. Well, they didn't go back home. They're still there. So these people had needs. They had no homes. They had no, no jobs. They had no city. And so what it was is they, would, they said, hey, let's help each other out. Why did they stay? Because they wanted to hear the teaching. This was God's plan to send the gospel all over the world. Do you see it? Instead of sending these 120 to hundreds of nations around the world, God brought the nations to them. Isn't that interesting of what happened here in the United States today? You know, I don't have to travel very far. You know how far I have to go to speak to the people from Africa? I got to go about a thousand yards that way. There's an Africa store up there. And there's a lady who owns it named Rose. She's a Muslim. I go in there about once a month and just sit down and visit with her and talk to her. And while I'm there, there'll be a dozen people in an hour come in from all over Africa. And I sit there and talk to each one of them and get to meet them. Right? What I'm saying is all the nations have come here. We've got this created all over again. And that's why our church, if we're going to be, remember what got us to here is not going to get us 50 years in the future. If we're going to continue 50 years in the future, we're going to have to be willing to reach out to other ethnicities and reach out to other people groups and realize that the gospel isn't just for us. And we've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. And that might get us out of our comfort zone. That might get us there, but that's exactly what this church was doing. It was a sharing church. And that's why they had it, whatever that it is. God had a plan, and this was fulfilling it. It doesn't say, listen, I said socialism earlier. Let me make sure you understand what I mean by that. It doesn't say that they quit their jobs. It doesn't say they sold their houses. It doesn't say they had a commune. Matter of fact, Look down in verse uh, 46. It says, they devoted themselves, ate together. They broke bread from house to house. Everybody still had their house. You see what I'm saying? That, that wasn't happening. They were helping those who were from other places out of town. And so uh, we see that. So the lesson is, if we have a brother and sister in need, if we have a church member in need, we should all be willing to help them. It's almost like a Facebook marketplace thing. I believe they sold items that they had. It's like, hey, I got a brother in need over here, and I got a refrigerator in my garage I don't need. I'm going to sell it on Facebook, and I'll give that money to my brother that's in need or whatever. That's the kind of stuff that was going on, I believe. So how did they get that good character? Why were they so committed? It's because they started with the right 
DNA. And then that brought them joy. Look at verse 46 at the bottom. It says, they ate their food with a joyful, humble attitude. Joy is contagious, right? Being happy and excited about Jesus Christ. It says, they did all this with gladness. And that gladness produced joy in their lives. Unity is what produces joy. When we pray together, it brings unity. When we serve together, it brings unity. Joy comes from unity, and unity comes when we care about God's glory and not our glory. Amen? And all of this led to the right results. They were an attractive church. Look at it, it says at the, at the verse 47. It says, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. This church was attractive. People couldn't resist. People wanted to know what was going on. The world looked at this group and couldn't believe what was happening. They wanted to be a part of it. And then it says, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. The last thing about them, they were a growing church. They were a growing church. Every day people were being saved. Every day people were being saved. This church had the right DNA. Notice there's not a lot of strategy sessions going on there. There's not a lot of uh, demographic studies it's literally people are doing what God called them to do, and people are getting saved. People are getting saved every single day because they were together and had one purpose. Spread the message. Obey Christ. Spread the message. Obey Christ. And that's all they did. If we'll do that, we'll start to show that right DNA, that right commitment. It takes everybody. We'll become an awesome church where we will see miracles, where we will see joy, and the results will come. We'll be attractive and we'll grow if we'll get back to that DNA. Will you bow your heads with me as we wrap up today? So where do we start? Where's the first place to start if we want to be like that first church? We start the DNA. And before we close, I want each of you to evaluate yourself. What about your DNA? If you did a, if you did a DNA check of yourself, if, it, if you, did, if you drew, a, drew a spiritual blood sample of your life, and checked your own DNA. The first question is this. Do you really know Jesus Christ? Have you been saved? Has there been a time in your life where you ask God to forgive you of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to come in your life? Romans 6.23 says, uh, 3.23 says, For all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. And that's why our faith must be in Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus? That's where you got to start. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, nothing else matters. None of this other stuff will make any sense to you. And the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. We must place our faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. I invite you to do that today. The second part of your DNA is are you committed to the study of the Word of God? They were committed to the teachings. They gave themselves and poured themselves into learning the teachings so that they could teach other people. Are you doing that? The third thing is, what about your fellowship? These folks were, were, were all in. They put their whole self into fellowship with one another. What about you? And fellowship is face-to-face. -face. It's face-to-face, -face and that brought joy. Are you part of fellowship, or do you isolate yourself? The fourth part of that DNA was prayer. What's your prayer life like? Do you pray that God would, would use you? I challenge our membership to pray that God would do in, in North Park what He did in this first church. Because it's the same God like we just sang about. He's the same God. And He wants to do the same things. But He doesn't come to where He's not invited. I pray that God would add to our church daily. And that people would look at you. They wouldn't look at this building. They wouldn't look at this preacher. They would just look at you. And go, man, I want what they got. And they would come to know Christ. It's all about that DNA. We need to get back to that as a church, as individuals. And there's none of us that are not, uh, there's none of us that don't need improvement in that area, including me. We got to get back to the basics and back to the DNA. And watch what God can do. Lord, I pray you take this message the lessons from the first church, we'd apply it to our hearts and lives, that we'd inspect our own DNA, not be looking at other people's, but look in the mirror, look at ours, 
Change what you say we need to change. Do what your Holy Spirit tells us to do. And may we be obedient to it. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness you offer us. And thank you for your word that tells us the truth. It tells us what we're supposed to be doing. We ask all this in your name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand as we have a time of invitation? If God's spoken to your heart, you can come and pray at the altar. Speak to one of the pastors. If you're not sure where you spend eternity, if today was your last day, we'd love to share that with you. We'd love to show you how you can be saved. If you'd like to join North Park Baptist Church, if you want to put your name on the, the roll on the membership list of this church, come and speak with us and we can have a conversation about that. However God leads you, you respond. Kurt? Thank you. You may be seated.